Um, I wanted to have a chat to you now. Uh, we're going on to the 89-90 season. And there was a situation where... I need, I need you to fill me in on this. Because I believe you were knocked unconscious at one point, which led to the FA changing its um, regulations of having club doctors sat in yeah. hand compared to on, on the pitch. I believe you, you were knocked unconscious and it was quite a touch and go at one point. What, what, what happened there? Was that the Leicester game, was it? Was it Leicester? Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it, was, um, it was a game where um, both myself and Trevor Morley, I'll never forget that game for different reasons, because Trevor Morley scored his first ever hat-trick for us. And he also reminded me that I took all the, all the headlines, even though it was <laughs> three. So he sent me this tongue-in-cheek uh, uh, get, get well soon card and uh, he made it abundantly clear that he wasn't happy that, uh, that he was uh, on the third row of the, uh, you know, of the, uh, the conversations in the, uh, in the tabloid and the broadsheet press. But yeah, it was, um, it was a bit early in the game, I think it was about 12, 15 minutes into the game. And, and um, it, it wasn't... Um, it, it wasn't a, a set piece that we'd worked on. I'm not, not sure who took the corner, but I don't think he made a great connection. And the, the ball, it, it was almost towards the edge of the box or just inside, you know what I mean? But I went up to head the ball. And as I've, I've gone to head the ball and head it down, um, the centre half for Leicester has come through and headed me, headbutted my temple with the same ferocity as if he was trying to head the football to clear the dead ball line. You know, so um, I landed awkwardly and then, you know, as far as I'm aware, I started to twitch and the and, um, thing was, uh, our doctor at the time, Dr. Luft, who's a lovely man, I think he was having uh, pie chips and gravy in the, uh, in the, in the chairman's bit and he had to put his, uh, his burger down and, 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 and run round to come, to come downstairs to, uh, to me. Roy Bailey was by my side at the time trying to managed my airway and the doc eventually got there and I started to, what I was being told was that I, I was starting to change colour because I've been, I'd my, my, I swallowed the tongue for that for that long, that period of time that it actually took some strange manoeuvre. I think they talked about getting a pair of medical scissors into my mouth because um, I'd, I'd bitten down and all the rest of it, you know. Um, so yeah, it was, it was touch and go. I mean, I was completely out of it. I came to in the first aid room under the stairs at Main Road. And I had three women there in the room all in tears. And, you know, one was my mum, one was one of the girls from upstairs and um, my girlfriend. And I actually said, who, who, Glenn, who, used, who died? And they said, well, you nearly did. And it was that much of a shock to me because I had, I had no oblivious to it. And I had to have assessments and wait a couple of weeks and then come back. But it was, um, yeah, it was certainly, uh, it, it, it was the reason why it took so long and everyone was so panicking because the doctor was, wasn't pit side. And so it, it made people realise that actually, you know, what, what on earth are we doing? Why is this happening? Because the doctor was often someone that would work part time. And depending on the management team, you won't necessarily be someone that they either, you know, really related to or actually wanted on the bench. So, you know, they might be someone that is a GP in local practice who the chairman knows, who comes in once a week. And, and so, you know, a manager and an assistant manager and whatever might not want them on the on the bench and might be feel a bit kind of you have to manage what they what they say, the P's and Q's and that confidentiality, you know, about talking yeah. with players. But that changed all that and it recognised the fact that you needed to have, you know, a medical provision that was gonna be there on a full time basis really. And and I think that was a start really of people starting to recognise that that the medical uh kind of um support for, for, for clubs on match days. And, and again, during the week, they had to raise the standards, both in terms of medical care, in terms of qualifications, all those things. I mean, we had at City, Roy Bailey, who was a, you know, a brilliant guy, you know, a, a, had, a, had a wonderful left foot, by the way, and had tennis, he was different class. But, um, but in terms of qualifications, he was underqualified. He was se severely underqualified. He wanted to do the job, he, he cared, but didn't have the skills to be able to deal with anything that was, you know, any injury that was remotely complicated and, and no injury is really straightforward. Um, and, and it's also managing the person as well as the injury, you know, because it's an holistic approach. Mm -hmm. So on the back of that, you know, I, when I did my knee, I had to go and be shipped off to, um, to Lillishall in, in Shropshire and, and just fend for myself really while I was there. I mean, he had qualified people there and good people there, but I spent almost a year of my life away from my club because no one could treat an anterior cruciate ligament injury. 
And the irony of it all was that when I was coming back and I was probably, he was struggling and I was getting to a later stage where I look, you know, I'm going to have to call it soon. But I was still trying, I was still rehabbing, doing, doing the best that I could. And Richard Edgell had ruptured his cruciate ligament. And I was doing his rehab for him. I was advising him what to do, what not to do. I was just a player, you know? And actually Edgy, when, when Edgy realised that, that, you know, um, when I spoke about it, he got really upset because he, 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 he recognised that of all that I was going through and never going to come back, all he was bothered about was himself. But that was a young man. And when I was that age, I was just bothered about myself. You know, he, he was, you know, really hard on himself, to be fair. But he said, didn't even think about what you were going through and that torturous situation where not only were you, you didn't have the surgeon that I had, which you should have had, that I was on my way to getting back fully fit and you were never going to get fit. And yet you were giving me all the tips and all the advice of how to rehab a knee injury properly because I, I, you know, I was doing it in my sleep. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, it just, that just kind of gives you an in, the insight into, into the level of medical, um, I'm not going to say incompetence because it's a bit harsh that, but it was just the standards at the time. You know, it was, it was, it was scandalous. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't at all clubs. Though. I mean, Manchester United had a very well qualified physio working with them. Dave Fever was a fantastic physio and a really great guy. Uh, we'd worked with the Wigan Warriors in rugby league for quite a few years and was very experienced and very knowledgeable, you know, but City were just, they just cut corners wherever they could. Peter Swells would just cut corners and would just, you know, he just didn't really get it. And, and um, you know, it, it was a, a shame that that's, that was the approach at the time, because if you think about it, if we were to look back at all the players that were injured and all the players that missed games, with more a more qualified mem members of staff, you might have finished in the leagues, you might have not been relegated. Mm. You know, look at it in those terms. You, you never know, and that's always hindsight's a great thing, but it wasn't even registered that with, with, um, with the hierarchy. It was only about saving money. You went over to America, didn't you, for for final batch of surgery? Was it the final batch of surgery, or certainly? It did, yeah, yeah. I went over when it was almost too late. Then I mean, I'd, I'd gone and I'd, I had two two failures, and damaged the knee even more. When I went over to the states, the, the consultant said, "You know, why am I seeing you now?" When I saw John Salako from Crystal Palace straight away, mm. when I saw Mikhail Chenko at Glasgow Rangers straight away. And yet I've been told that you were linked with, you know, being a potential England captain. So why are you, why is it taking this amount of time for you to be over here to see me? He said, and I'll tell you now, Paul, he said, the amount of movement in your knee, I, I've, re, I've repaired ACLs of quarterbacks that have been hammered, that haven't got as unstable a joint as the one that you've got. And that's all down to the recurrence of the, you know, the re-rupturing and re-rupturing. So when you when you sat there and you hear those things, I mean, you can imagine what what my thoughts are. And it kind of shows you the standards that we had and the and the mindset and whether I was treated. I mean, I wasn't even going to go over to the states if it hadn't been for um, all of the uh, the players. All the players clubbed together to pay for my flights. Can you believe that? That's a professional football club. And then even the physiotherapist who flew over with me when he flew back, he flew back in in. Um, business class and I was made to fly back in economy class so all of the flexion that I'd worked on to 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 come back to I lost in the flight and I had to get a wheelchair off of the plane because my knee had swollen and it was that sore I couldn't move and that's that was that was how you were made to feel so you think of that as a as a value of a, as a person you know and and how your club thinks of you and and you know I just and it wasn't, that wasn't, if Peter Reid had, had, had knew, about that, knew about that, he'd have gone absolutely ballistic. Mm -hmm. But I just thought, well, you know, what's done is done. I'm, I'm back home now, I'm seeing family again, I'm just going to get on with it, you know, and, and see if anything's going to come of this. And it didn't, you know, but um, yeah, it certainly, it gives you an insight into, into um, how people are treated. And, and again, you know, when you think about how players are treated today, it doesn't matter that they're on how many thousands of pounds a week. It's still a human being that, that has got a worry about will they come back as the same player? You know, how will it Im impact on their confidence? You know, is someone going to take their place and we're not going to get the place back? You're going to have to leave the club and go and move somewhere else. And all these things, you know, happen to players of, of you know, of all ages and at all times. And, um, you know, I had all those insecurities, but, you know, added to the fact that, you know, I, I wasn't even valued by my club at that time. But also as a young man with no life experience and no idea what to do next.
so it was you know it was a, it was a tough old time did you ever have a very frank conversation with swales about that I did. I did. I pulled him. Ironically, I, I did a piece because what was funny was back in the day, you'd have the tabloid press to be on the bottom of the stairs at Main Road. Just as you're walking out, have you got? Have you got a minute? And you used to have chat. You know, and I was I was made to feel like you know how I was made to feel, and I've already described that. So I was I wasn't in a good place anyway. And then uh, I did. A, I got asked by. Uh, I did a piece for the people. Remember the Sunday people, and we did a piece for them about. And I just said, look, I've been treated like a piece of meat. Just hung about an abattoir. That's how I was made to feel. Just completely forgotten and completely devalued uh, as a as a human being, never mind as a city player and a city fan. It's how I was made to feel. So um, oh, sad. When, so when this piece was done, and I, I was on the Monday or the Tuesday, I was going up the stairs at Main Road. Uh, ironically, ironically, I'd, I had you remember Helen the Bell? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what Helen would yeah. do sometimes, she just she just if the car door was open, she just plonk herself in the passenger seat and say, "Are you going by Manchester Royal or Infirmary?" And you say, well, obviously I am now, Helen, no problem. Flower shop. She yeah. me, so she was sat in my car outside. So I got upstairs to get some mail, um, probably a bill from the, uh, from the, from the niece of his report. Um, and, he got, and, and he was coming down steps. And he just basically said that he wasn't, he wasn't impressed with the piece that I put in the paper. And suffice it to say that we had a, a heated conversation about how he made me feel and, and what I'd been through and that he had no inclination as to, as to as to what my life was, was like at this moment in time, and and it, it even got to the stage where when you I was training back at Main Road, uh, um, sorry, we we're at Platt Lane by that time, and I'd come back from Lillyshaw after two weeks and go in and say morning guys and say morning, and I go on the table and I look at my knee and say right, you know, go off to the gym then, and I go to the gym by myself, so I might as well have been at Lillyshaw because I'd be on my own again, and I come back to Platt Lane just to get a bit of ice on my knee, and then it'd be that'd be it, it'd be like see you later. So you're around the lads, but you, you might, I might as well have been in the next room or in the next, you know, city for, for that was, you know, again. So the psychology of how to treat people is certainly changed over time. But, you know, if you're made to feel um, like you were an outsider, that's exactly how I was made to feel. Um, and the, the Peter Swales thing was just, you know, as a, as a case in point. So, you know, as much as, I don't know what his standpoint and what his center of reference was. You know, as a young man, I, I harbored a lot of ill will towards him and, and, and he tried to be magnanimous over time, but it's just, that's a part of my life that was ruined and, and I felt like it was a miserable time for me. And he encapsulated all that was bad about my life then. You know, love lost. No. No. As, as that period in time, in, in reflection, have you had other footballs come to you that have been injured, career threatening injured. Have you ever spoken to other footballers? Do you have any other advice for other footballers that come to you in that situation, how to get through it, even though it's, it's it must have been a tough situation for you? Well, yeah. I mean, if, if I mean, when I when I'd uh, obviously retired from football, I became a, a chartered physiotherapist, and uh, and 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 again, you know, that's that's the irony of it all is that all teams have their insurance, so every player has the potential to see, you know, a, a, a competent experienced consultant. So I would always give them the players that I work with, you know, first opinion, second opinion, if you want the third opinion, you won't get a third opinion. I'd make sure that I, I researched who was out there, who was, you know, experienced in sports injuries and football injuries and, and even get advice from other physios at top clubs and say, you know, so I'd, I might ring United, I might ring Arsenal and say, you know, do you mind just giving me a minute of your time? I just said, I've got this player, I've got this injury, it's quite, you know, uh, it's quite a challenge and it's a bit more complicated than a straightforward, whatever it might be. And who would you recommend? And that would be, that's a phone call. That's two phone calls. It's three phone calls. It's 15 minutes of your time. And even that wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't even get that, you know? And, and, and again, these are the, uh, this is what I, I learned. So I always made sure that whatever club I was at, every player had the best opportunity and the best chance. And that I made them feel important. So if I had six, five, six injuries, I'd make sure that they came at, say, half 11 rather than coming at nine or 9.30 because they'd be hanging around. Mm. And you do that three or four times and it starts to affect your mental health because you feel like you're inconvenienced. And, oh, and by the way, what about me? Am I not important now? You know, and I've got a mortgage to pay and I've got a family to keep and I've got a contract that's running out at the end of the season and I need to get fit. So you recognise all these things. You've just got to manage your time and manage people and respect people no matter what level they're at, whether they're an academy player 
whether they've got 400 league games and, and international caps. You're still a human being that, that has got an injury that needs to be dealt with. And so that's what I would do. I would, I would speak to players and if I didn't know, I'd find out. You know, and I was, I was inexperienced. I, I was experienced with injuries and the mindset of injuries, but I was inexperienced as a physiotherapist. So I'd get support, I'd get help, I'd get advice. And, and these were the things that, I, that I, I learned. And then obviously today, guys, I mean, the, the medical teams are, across the leagues are, are so much more competent, uh, you know, and there's a, like many hospitals in their own, you know, in their own areas, you know, certainly City have got an incredible medical support. And, and they'll go and see not only what the best um, advice that is given, but also the best um, consultants that are out there and which of which the players feel most comfortable. So if Sergio goes out to Spain or whatever, that's because he's had that experience with that individual and he had a, a, a knee niggle maybe five years ago and he got back great with it and he feels happy with that. Then, then so be it. It's about making sure that everything's right so when the player comes back, he, he's, uh, he's raring to go and that support's all in place. And it's just a bit of thought mm. and, and, and a bit of how would you like to be treated? And so, yeah, so I'd... But, you know, when I was a physiotherapist at, at some of the clubs, you, you become more than that, you become a confidant, but you also have people that have got family issues, that have got, you know, um, relationship problems, that have got, you know, family members that are, that are seriously ill, that have lost the confidence, that may have, you know, mild depression. That have, you know, all these things. So you get to hear a lot and it's how you manage that and you filter back to the manager what's important without breaking confidences, but at the same time recognising that if, if I'm going to build this rapport and trust with this player, it's got to be a two-way street. And so you give a little bit, but you have your boundaries and you don't have the, the mickey taken out of you. But then over time, you just, you just create the environment which works really well and the standards that you set become the same for everybody. So everyone's treated the same. Everyone knows what the start times are, you know, when we're going to go here, when we're doing this, when we're doing that, and then the conversation with the manager. So there was no, it was all transparent. There was no like, you know, whispers in corners and, you know, no one's saying, I won't touch him with the barge pole and he's doing this and he's doing that. But, you know, and it, it's never straightforward. There's always complications because life and people's personalities can often get in the way and that can be quite interesting. But it's all part of life's rich pageant. And in the, in the footballing world, you know, the, the medical teams today have got some incredibly talented and demanding individuals, but that's because they're elite and because, you know, you and I can watch these games of a weekend and know that our team, the majority of players are going to be an eight, a nine out of 10, David Silva, nine out of 10 week in and week out. Just and that's based on everything, the player, the talent, the psychology of, but also the support mechanisms in place, you know, and that, that togetherness, you just really amplified to make the players the best. That they can be and as I say when you come back to watching the training it, it is like watching a FIFA uh, game it, it's just like you know at times perfect football which we, we've seen we've been blessed seeing some incredible goals incredible players and um, and the standard is now set and it's just wonderful that you know you can you can glance back and you can look forward and that is all there's lots of learning in all the areas of the game but certainly I would suggest that from a medical perspective Things have improved immeasurably. Yeah, you see, you see, it is. It's funny you mentioned about City's current sort of um, medical idea. They've got like cryogenics tubes, haven't they, and all sorts yeah, of deep yeah. baths and all sorts of things. So it's it's, it's phenomenal, actually. How, how I think mini I think mini hospital is the perfect way you put it there. So here's a mini mm. hospital going going inside it. I want I want to take you now to Dave. Do you have any questions about that before before we move on? I know you've no. I mean, you've honestly, Paul. You've you've almost had me in tears. To be perfectly honest, you know uh, the, the legend that is Paul Lake, and you know you you are one for for every Manchester City fan. For you to talk in those terms uh, about that, that just it honestly just 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 brings me to tears. And and thank God, as you say, that things have moved on, and we're. We're now not in that position, you know. I was going to highlight, you know, Aguero is a perfect example of what you were saying, Paul. That got injured his knee. I think within twelve hours he was in Barcelona, yeah. uh, and the following day he's, he's having his operation. And thankful we've had some good news today that he's, you know, he's saying that it's gone well. And you know, fingers crossed, fingers you know, crossed we'll, yeah. we'll see him again this season. But yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, mate. The um, eighty-nine ninety season was was. Um, I, 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 please, please tell me if, if I'm wrong. But I think, I think that was a, a good season for you. Howard Kendall mm -hmm. came in, which you obviously mentioned the best possible, best possible you ever had. 
Um, and obviously beating United 5-1 as well is, is always a good side, I think. Can we, can we talk about the derby first, the 5-1? Because it's got a big yeah. smile on her face. And I think you might recognise the a few pictures above. Yeah, and yeah, I'll, I'll just get out of the way as well so you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, yeah, I mean, it's always always fond memories uh, when we talk about the derby. And, and, and again, I, mean, I always mentioned it in my book and was around uh, driving to the game because we had to... When you when you drive to to, to to games, you always give yourself a. You don't want to be there too soon. You don't want to be hanging around, but you don't want to obviously be late. And quite often, it's quite amusing. Is it when when you see well, oh, he's been dropped today. He's been dropped. Actually, you no, know, he was late. You know, because everyone was would, would drive to the game themselves. There was no like you go obviously to away games on, on the coach, but the home games you drive in. And you know what it can be like sometimes when you get near to Longside Market and all the traffic around there. It's a disaster. And I remember getting crawling over the lights there, and there was a City fan with his son at the bus stop and he saw me and I saw him and it's one of those that kind of acknowledgement kind of thing and he just stood up put his hands together and he said he was praying and she said oh. please please <laughs> you not know, like that he was quite amusing but it's quite touching as well and that stayed with me all the way into the stadium to be honest and uh, and then obviously when we when we were in there it was the young players that were kind of that were the almost control the environment you know and and uh, obviously Redo and Bob Brightwell Whitey Andy Inch myself you know um you know, and, and we just we were just so fired up. It was one of those games where, if you could have bet your mortgage on on us not losing, or certainly not out of you know the want of trying, you know, there was just there in abundance and uh, and uh, and obviously going out onto the pitch. And my best mate Jason Beck was on the bench as well, so it was it was great that he was part of it. And obviously a full house noise was incredible. Um, and then, as as I'm sure you can remember, after ten minutes or so, we had, we had to come off the pitch because of the United fans in the, uh, I think they were in the North Stand, weren't they? And they, had to, they yeah. all flowed out onto the pitch, and we had to go back up the, uh, up the, um, up the tunnel. And Tony Book calmed us down, and he just said, "Look, we prepared you for this day. You, you're ready. You know, just go back out there and just, you know, just just take control of the controllable. So your first pass, your first touch, you know, when you tackles, you know, when you one v ones." And, and if you all do that uh, as, a, as an accumulative, then you're going to be in a really strong place. And when we came back, it was just that. We won, we won every tackle, every header. You know, United just couldn't get going. The, it was like, you know, when you talk about a high press game, we just didn't give them an inch. And then as you can remember, when, when Dave Olfield scored his first goal, I mean, that, that uh, free kick, Man Hinskiff, out, out wide to Whitey. And Whitey, again, his first touch. And Whitey's t- first touch for that, cr- that cross for that goal and also his first touch and his well, his, his cross for the for the fifth. You know, Whitey's was often um, much maligned for his, uh, his his crossing at times, but you know he was absolutely bang on it that day. And and Dave Oldfield scores a great finish, and then the second one you know, happened so quickly when we intercepted it, and then I had a shot and it was parried and tricky mall. He's tapped it in to make it two, and then the third goal that uh, that that Bish scored and. It's funny, it's funny, it's like, if you ever listen to the commentary of the 74 World Cup final, it talks about when Holland scored in the first minute, and it was about them scoring too soon. And even though it was 3-0 at half-time, we're thinking, you want the game to end? <laughs> you want to, That's you know, sick all over though, that end. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, of course, when they get one back, you're thinking, right, here, here we go. And they had a couple of chances. Uh, Brian Gale and Gary Fleming were superb. And Gary Fleming, I thought, was man of the match. To be honest with you, he, defensively, he was he was he was incredible. And you had Paul Cooper in goal. You know, the, the oldest player on the pitch by 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 some margin was just chatting away and just you know giving that re, reinforced um, you know messages and cues and the occasional volley. But we scored the fourth goal. Um, the ball came to me. It, it, whether it, it was never a handball, it, the ball hit my hit my arm and bounced for me, and I, I took it on, and then I. Uh, I shot, which Jim Layton got down to, and Gary Pallister came across. And I went to shoot, but then just checked it back for Dave Oldfield. Had an open goal to make it four, and that was the goal that sealed the derby because it just they, you could see them physically deflate, you know, yeah. and turning round and and uh, going past. And I, I tell um, a story: there was a lad in the um, United end, and he, um, I saw him. It, it, bizarrely, it's a guy that I used to go to school with, and he was he was a red. And you know he was one of those lads that was he was one of their crew. And he spat at me, <laughs> and uh, you know just carried on the game finished. And about it's about two three weeks later, I was in St Anne Square. There was a, a menswear shop um, called Ted Baker, 
And I was in there and this lad comes in and he goes, uh, like you. I said, oh, how are you, lad? You're all right. He said, uh, I saw you at the derby. He said, yeah, I know when I saw you. He said, I spat at you. He said, yeah, I know, you missed. So he said, you know what? I felt really bad about that. All the years I was at school with you and seeing you do so well for City, even though I hate City, he said, I just can't believe that you're in here. I feel so bad for doing that. I said, well, don't worry, mate. You know, I'm here today to spend me £30 bonus. Don't worry, it's fine. And then he just said, look, I feel really bad. I want to make it up to you. He said, I tell you what, have a look in the shop and whatever you want, I'll nick it for you. <laughs> so I, like, oh, I don't really want, I want to hear, pal, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, Brilliant. I'll decline the offer, but thanks very much. So, welcome uh, to Manchester. Welcome to Manchester, yeah. Oh, yeah so, wow. so, um, so, yeah, so I have, I have fond memories of that game for different reasons as well. But yeah, I mean, and again, Manchester at the time, though, don't forget, you know what? It was just absolutely buzzing. So Manchester um, City Centre, you know, was just full of blues. And it was just being able to give, I mean, now these players are giving us that legacy of trophies and, you know, going to Wembley and having these wonderful experiences of our team winning, winning the Premier League time and time again. It's just breathtaking, so lucky. But then just to be able to give us a victory against United, you know, was a legacy of sorts. You know, and, and, and that's what we all clung on to. I remember when I was a kid, you know, if we, I remember watching, listening out for the game when we betrayed with United 2 2 at, uh, at Old Trafford and Frank Stapleton scored two to equalise. You know, that was an amazing result. We didn't get beat at Old Trafford. Wow, you know, that was a thrill. So from where we were to where we are now, I mean, there must be young fans that I've got no idea of that, can't even begin to fathom what that would have felt like for us. But you know, and again, I just think it's a lovely time to be able to experience that. And there's an old saying that the All Blacks, that you pass the shirt on, no matter what you, how you played or what emphasis or what, you know, kind of impact you had in as, as, as the squad, you were still part of it. And to be able to pass the shirt on for all of us to where we are now, it's a kind of a lovely idea. And uh, it's something that, you know, again, we all, we all feel proud of that. You know, we do. Brilliant. There's so many great quotes that come out of that, but I just want to tell you this one. Sir Alex Ferguson, Sir Alex Ferguson called it the most embarrassing defeat of his career. Yeah. That's nice. I like that. Yeah. Have you got, yeah. have you got on your wall somewhere? You must have. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, we know it, and, and it's interesting you say that. There's a couple of things about I mean, Sir Alex. I mean, Sir Alex um, kindly sorted out my, um, my testimonial, you know, and, and course, he, 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 he was, yeah. was going to fall apart. It literally was Glasgow Rangers were going to play. And they, the, the police wanted a ridiculous amount of money to police it. So there would have been hardly any profit at all. It would have been worthwhile doing it, to be honest. And it was just purely by chance that it was a guy that I knew. He was a, an honorary president at City Still is, a guy called Tudor Thomas. He knew Sir Alex. And he was at a, a fundraising event. He was sat at the same table as Sir Alex. And Sir Alex said, I, was your, I believe you're part of the committee for Paul H's testimony. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, yeah. And he said, um, have you got anyone? He said, well, it keeps falling in flat. He's tried... Um, Glasgow Rangers tried Celtic they're trying you know, might even have to look something like Bolton Wanderers to get a game in and he said well why haven't you asked me and so she said well it's because I thought you wouldn't be interested he said well, well ask me then I said well would you play for Bolton yeah of course I would the lad's been through a hell of a lot and I want to make sure that you know he's giving the right send off I mean and that that's why when you know about these things you know I mean I, I was obviously anti-red and I always want United to lose on a derby day you know and, and but it just changed a little bit about me, about him, because he recognised what I'd been through and I didn't even know that he knew my name properly apart from the fact that I played against him, but didn't know me as a person, you know? And and, um, and ironically, I spoke at an event about two years ago about mental health issues, because I, I struggled with depression when I had to retire from football and I was in, a, you know, I, str I struggled for a few years and it never truly leaves you, but you just manage it as best as you can. And I was at an event in Northern Ireland uh, speaking about mental health problems. And uh, it was a good friend of mine um, who invited me over, uh, Pat McGibbon, who was a young player at Man United. And, and, and um, what he didn't tell me that I was I was speaking on the same um, sort of um, speaking order as uh, Sir Alex. I had to follow Sir Alex Ferguson. So you go to Northern Ireland. I said to the guy before the, the, the presentation started, I said, are there any City fans in here today? He said, yeah, one, it's you. I was speaking in front of a room of about 350 United fans. So picture the scene. I've just followed Sir Alex. And I, what I did was I never, was never able to thank him for playing a game for me. So I thanked him 
at that stage. And it wasn't contrived, I never had the chance to, so I thought it was a really great opportunity for me to say thank you, and I did do. Um, but the presentation was about my career. So it was a room full of United fans with all Man City, you know, uh, footage for the next 10, 15 minutes, you know? And it was just comical, but when you speak with honesty and you speak about, you know, with, 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 with frankness and you, you recognise, because don't forget, after them, they'd won like, you know, how many league titles? So it was a bit of a, you know, difficult, you know, kind of argument to have with them. But it was just getting a different side to a manager that you didn't know, you know? So you see somebody, I know, and, and his success and like him or loathe him. But when something like that happens to you personally, it just, you know, it, it can't, can't but change, you know, your opinion of somebody. And, and mine certainly has, you know, from that particular time onwards. But yeah, you're right. Being part of his, his worst defeat against City is, is quite a nice thing to have in your locker. It's a fantastic gesture we've made as well, that, isn't it? That's, that'll go down, yeah. go down. That's something I didn't know about either. So fair, fair, fair play to him for that. And we're going yeah. to going to advertise that. And just a quick request. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe and leave a comment to let us know what you think of the, uh, the interview. I do listen to and read all the comments. So your feedback is warmly welcomed. Thanks, Blues.